race to win malls and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions. High heels, the ultimate feminine shoe that was originally invented for men. Space Blanket, how this metallic marvel saved a million dollar space mission. Cans, why you need to thank Napoleon Bonaparte for your tin of food. Reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. High heels are a symbol of elegance, style and femininity. They're the ultimate accessory to any stylish outfit. Did you know though, that their history could not be further from the catwalks and dinner parties of today, and that they were actually once a tool of war? High heels were initially made for men in around the 16th century. History tells us that they were made in Persia for military men in the Persian army who needed high heels when they were riding horses to keep their feet steady in the stirrups when they were standing up to fire bow and arrows. When messengers and diplomats of Persia and the Ottoman Empire began journeying to Europe, their distinctive footwear soon became a talking point. Wealthy aristocrats saw the Persian diplomats wearing these high heels and really liked them and thought they sort of made them look virile and masculine. As well as this, despite the difficulties in walking in high heels, these new shoes also provided something of a practical use. The streets of 16th century Europe were not a pretty sight. Dirt and human waste, littered roads and pavements, and high heels were a perfect way to literally rise above this filth. The obvious added height that high heels gave to the wearer were also a big attraction. Back in 16th century England, King Henry VIII was recognised for his towering stature and stood at over six foot tall. Men wanting to mimic this powerful image in order to affirm their status in society adopted high heels. Even two centuries later, high heels were just as big, if not an even bigger symbol of power than ever. Louis XIV was often seen wearing lavish high-heeled shoes in a bid to compensate for his lack of natural height. He specifically wore high-heeled shoes with red soles and allowed his closest allies to do so. But what about women wearing high heels? Women in heels coincided with the overall unisex approach to fashion in the 17th century. Aristocratic women would often adopt traditionally masculine fashions and behaviours, such as smoking pipes, cutting their hair and adding epaulets to their outfits. Wearing high heels became an extension of this trend. However, as the Age of Enlightenment gained full traction, where scholars and philosophers would encourage intellectual reasoning and an emphasis on education over traditional aristocratic privilege, men's fashion became more practical and the elaborate heels began to shrink. It wasn't until the late 19th century that high heels were in vogue again. The invention of photography began to transform fashion and the female self-image. Photographers soon realised that high heels complemented and accentuated the female figure. Through the following decades into the 20th century, heels would come and go. Some incarnations would even briefly find their way back into men's fashion, such as cowboy boots and the beetle boot made famous by the Beatles. But it was in women's fashion that they would find their home. Today, they're firmly established as a must-have item in the wardrobe of fashion-conscious women. Most modern high street high-heeled shoes are produced using machine-based techniques. However, some bespoke shoemakers still prefer the care and attention that only hand-making shoes can provide. One such company is Sargasso & Grey. Sargasso & Grey is a British shoe company based in London. We were established in 2012 and we started trading in 2014. So, what's the advantage of handmaking shoes? You get a finer quality pair of shoes because you've got a lot more attention to detail. The first step in creating these shoes is to cut the upper and lining. Using a shoe pattern and a sharp shoe knife, the leather is carefully hand cut around the pattern. After this, the skiving machine is set up according to the thickness of the leather. The edges of the material are then fed into the skiving machine and skived, or in simpler terms, thinned out. We use a skiving machine which just thins the edges of the leather and that enables them to be easily folded over and stitched when you stitch them to the inner lining of the shoe. 
as the leather itself is quite floppy and lacks sturdiness, a backing material must be added to it. This is done by placing a material such as cotton onto the leather and then, using the glue, the material is ironed on at a temperature of around 70 degrees so that the material fixes to the leather, ensuring it is now stiff enough to hold its shape as a shoe. Folding tape is then added to the edges and glue applied. Before folding, using a hammer. Using a sewing machine, the top line, or outer part of the shoe, is stitched to the inner lining, otherwise known as the trim. Once this is done, any excess material of the inner lining is trimmed away. The lining is then separated from the upper of the shoe and a pocket is created. A stiffener material is put into this pocket and then by using a hot back part moulding machine at a temperature between 70 and 80 degrees, the heel is given its shape. The next stage of the process is called hand lasting. At this point, the insole board and shank are nailed onto the last. For all those non-shoe experts out there, the shank is a key part of the support structure of the sole of the shoe and the last is essentially just a mould that the shoe is shaped around. After nailing these to the last, the upper of the shoe is positioned around this moulding using glue and then fixing it with tacks using a pinch hammer. This is then secured to the insole board and the supportive shank. Our shoe is now beginning to take shape. As the bottom of the shoe is smooth, it needs to be prepared in order for a better bond when gluing the sole to the upper part of the shoe. This process is called ruffling and, using a ruffling machine, rough edges are created in the leather that will enable the glue to stick. Meanwhile, the all-important high heel of the shoe is constructed by fixing hard-wearing leather to a plastic moulded heel part. Once the ruffling is complete, the bottom of the shoe is marked with a sole pattern and carefully glued, ready for the soles to be stuck to it, as well as attaching the high heel. To ensure a good, durable shoe, once the sole has been stuck by hand, the shoe is then put under a hydraulic shoe press for five minutes and then left overnight for the glue to properly dry and set. The next day, nails are hammered into the heel part of the shoe and then the shoe is taken from the last before firmly securing the heel by screwing it to the heel shank. The insole of the shoe, or sock, might need a logo stamping to it or a label stitched to it at this point. So, depending on which, the sock is put into a stamping machine, or otherwise, the label is hand-stitched. We're at the finishing stages now, and the shoe is almost ready. The sock is stuck inside the shoe, which is then gently heated or ironed, in order to remove imperfections, such as dents and creases in the leather. And the final step is if there's any, any glue spots or any marks, you just get a cloth or some special wipes and then very, very gently just clean around the shoe to remove any residual marks. Once the shoes have been given a final clean and polish, they're carefully boxed up. And voila, we have our luxury high-heeled shoe, ready to add glamour to the feet of its owner. Now that's one stylish, wicked invention. The Space Blanket. These shiny sheets have today become a familiar sight as they are worn by exhausted runners finishing marathons. But these metal marvels have actually been an essential tool for NASA since the 1960s. It is commonly believed that space is a cold, dark void, but that is not really the whole story. As space is a vacuum, it doesn't actually have a temperature itself. But objects placed in it can be cold or hot, depending on their distance and exposure to the sun. There are three main ways of transferring heat down here on Earth. Conduction, direct contact from one object to another, think of a teaspoon warming up when it is left in a cup of hot coffee. Convection, the transfer of heat through air, as you would find with a radiator warming a room, and radiation, where light and heat energy are emitted from a source, a light bulb for example. In space, radiation is the main way heat can be transferred from one object to another and the sun is the biggest heat source in our solar system. This leads to massive temperature swings for material depending if it is facing or hidden and its distance from the sun. For example, a piece of metal in constant exposure to the sun can heat up to 260 degrees Celsius, yet cool to minus 100 degrees Celsius if in the shade. The space blanket was one method NASA used combat these extremes. The space blankets date back to the late 50s, early 60s, when NASA was dealing with the problem that a spacecraft in space is either in very bright sunlight or in the dark. 
And so the electronics inside, for example, or the people, could get very, very hot. And they solved this problem by finding a way of depositing gold or silver on a very, very thin plastic blanket. In space, a space blanket works by radiating the incoming um, solar radiation back out again because of the reflecting gold or silver surfaces. And many people will have seen this covering the bottom half of the Apollo lunar module and giving it its famous gold foil appearance. The material is made up of vaporized metal, most commonly aluminium, that is deposited onto a plastic substrate layer. This means the blanket is very light, flexible, strong and has excellent reflective properties which reflect infrared rays that can cause heating. The blanket's importance to NASA was most memorably demonstrated in 1973, when its use saved the Skylab missions. On launch, one of the main solar panel arrays and a micrometeorite shield that was to protect the space station were damaged. The result was that Skylab only ever had one panel deployed, when it was supposed to have two. And without the meteorite shield, it had little thermal protection that resulted in dangerously high temperatures of 130 degrees Fahrenheit being generated on board. NASA's solution was to turn to their trusty space blanket and come up with an ingenious improvised solution that saw the first crew members on board the space station deploy a parasol made up of the shiny material to keep the temperatures on board in the livable range of about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Millions of dollars worth of equipment and years of research had all been saved by the shiny metal sheets. Since the late 1970s, the material's reflective properties have seen it being used on Earth. It was found that participants in hugely popular marathons were particularly at risk from hypothermia, as it could take some time after finishing before they could get back to their belongings and put on some warm clothes. If the race was ran on a cool day, their core temperatures could plummet dangerously and lead to illness. The New York Marathon was one of the first events to implement the potentially life-saving space blanket technology. The body can lose heat by a couple of different methods in this circumstance. One is through convection, where heat radiates off the body, and also evaporation, where your sweat helps to cool the body down by evaporating off the surface. Using a space blanket, with a foil, almost like a foil surface to it, helps to reflect the heat back in. And this is done by a number of ways. One is to reduce the heat loss. This will um, reduce the amount of warm air coming off your body and also from the wind taking some of this warm air away. You would be using it almost like an inside-out basis where you're trying to retain the heat with next to the body so that the loss isn't so great. So in reality, the space blanket's the perfect solution because it's durable and flexible, very lightweight, and now um, ambulances will carry them all folded up, easy to use and store for use in emergency situations. NASA's space blanket technology has led to it being incorporated into a number of products, from the lightweight sheet carried by mountain walkers for survival situations, to sleeping bags lined with the reflective material to help improve the bag's thermal qualities, and on to house insulation and medical uses. The space blanket is truly a weird invention. We've seen how the reflective properties of a space blanket can help keep an object cool by repelling the sun's rays. But can we do the opposite? Can we warm something up? In fact, maybe even cook it, just by using the power of the sun and a piece of reflective oil. Yes, we can. Our intrepid tester is feeling a little peckish, but luckily he has some leftover pizza. Unfortunately, he likes his pizza warm. Never fear, we can construct a solar-powered oven made from the pizza box. The materials are pizza box, aluminium foil, clear adhesive tape, heavy duty food wrap, black construction paper, craft knife, scissors and a ruler. To begin, draw a square on top of your pizza box lid. Cut along three sides of the square to create a flap. Tape a sheet of aluminium foil to the underside of your flap you have just created. This will reflect the sun's rays into the box. Create a window over the hole left in the pizza box lid by covering it with the plastic wrap and taping down. Make sure it has an airtight seal and repeat on the underside of the box to create a double-sided window. This will help keep the heated air trapped in the box. Line the inside of the pizza box with aluminium foil. 
as black material absorbs heat, line the bottom of the pizza box with the black construction paper. Your oven is now ready to start cooking. Midday is the perfect time for cooking as the sun is directly overhead and is providing its maximum heat. Our tester places his perfect piece of pizza in the box and securely shuts the lid, making sure no air can escape. Our tester angles the foil flap to direct the sun rays into the box where it heats the trapped air inside. The longer the time, the more the air will heat until the pizza starts cooking. It may be the definition of slow cooking, but 45 minutes later, the pizza is piping hot and ready to eat. Mmm, yummy steaming pizza and just cooked by the power of the sun and a reflective oil. Preserving food has been an ongoing challenge throughout history. The struggle to make seasonal produce available during the whole year and in a transportable form has led to many culinary innovations over the centuries, including pickling, salting, drying, and even jellying. These techniques may have improved the shelf life of food and allowed provisions to be kept on board ships for months at a time, but there has always been a downside taste. If you're away on a ship for months on months on end, eating nothing but pickled pork and salt cod, you're going to have a very sodium rich, relatively bland diet, so that you'd get fed up quite quickly. Yet again it was military necessity that would lead to an invention that would become part of our everyday lives. A simple metal container that revolutionised the food industry, the tin can. It was the French military innovator Napoleon Bonaparte who wanted to end the logistical nightmare of supplying fresh food to thousands of men on the campaign that led to the invention of the humble can. Napoleon Bonaparte was obsessed with being able to provide his troops with the right foods as they marched and conquered their way across Europe and he opened up a kind of competition, a trial, to find a way of preserving foods which didn't involve the previous ways, which were always air drying, salt drying, alternatively a very laborious way of having to take a butcher on to campaign with you, or to see with fresh flocks of sheep and cows and stuff. They always occupied a lot of space, never tasted as good. So he wanted to find a way where he could get that food, process it and keep it and then distribute it through the troops. With 12,000 francs on offer to the best solution to Napoleon's problem, a confectioner and brewer named Nicolas Appert scooped the prize money in 1810 with a technique that had taken 15 years to perfect. Appert placed foodstuffs such as vegetables and dairy products inside sealed glass jars and immersed them in boiling water. This pasteurizing process killed most of the microorganisms that caused the food to rot. The result was food that would last just as long as some of the traditional preserving methods, but taste a great deal better. Indeed, Appert's method was so successful and so simple that it was soon copied and improved upon. By 1813, British businessmen Brian Donkin and John Hall were supplying the British Army with food preserved using Appert's technique, but now they were using tin cans instead of glass jars. The great thing about cans is they're lightweight, they're easy to produce, although at the time it wasn't, and they can be heated up to high temperatures and like the glass jars. The British completely embraced it. Um, food for the first time could be produced, could be freshly produced and sent around the world without fear of spoiling or damage, but even other things, medical supplies, um, drinks, it, it really opened up a whole new chapter and closed that door to some degree on the previous techniques of salting, preserving, dry curing, brining and pickling. The popularity of canned foods only increased as the British Empire grew around the globe. From the 1800s to the present day, from military operations to domestic cooking, all have come to appreciate the usefulness of the tin can, even if the can opener arrived 40 years too late in 1855. Before the can opener was invented, people used a chisel and a hammer to smash their way into the can. You had to be very careful because it left razor sharp jagged edges and of course you could ruin the food inside. Then we went through that period where you'd get a key with the can and it would almost take a strip of the metal out and move it around. The problem is if you lost the key you had no way of getting the food out. So the invention of a can opener was really quite a benefit to the world. The tin can, truly a wicked invention. 
William Say have been manufacturing cans from their factory in London since 1930. Today, their production lines produce millions of cans every year for some of the world's biggest brands. Production starts with two different cuts of sheet metal, one that has been pre-printed with a label, which is used to make the body, and another sheet that is pre-cut to make the circular lids and bases of the cans. For the circular parts, a large stack of sheet metal is taken to the press line, where there are two different types of machine. One is a manual press, and the other is an automated press. At the manual press machine, a worker feeds strips of metal into the press and uses a foot pedal to initiate the machine. This cuts out a circular component, which can either be the lid or the base of the can, depending on what is required. This component falls down a chute and up onto a magnetic belt. This belt then takes the components to a seamer and applies a safety curl, which bends the metal back, removing any sharp edges. The reason you use tin as the tin can is that it's much better than steel. Steel in the presence of water or in the presence of bacteria starts to rust, corrode and gets destroyed. And steel particularly will flake, exposing new steel, and so it will just continually degrade the can very fast and it will just become useless. Tin on the other hand stops bacteria from forming. It also acts as a coat that doesn't break down if it is slightly reacted. And so it provides a nice sealed system that doesn't destroy itself on, with the contact of the food inside it. At the automatic press machine, it is essentially doing the same job as a manual press, but is able to feed itself, make the cuts into the metal, release the component and dispose of the excess. This machine can operate at a much quicker rate. It also has interchangeable tools that can be changed depending on the product that is required. For the body of the can, the pre-printed sheets of metal are put through a guillotine machine. For safety reasons, this machine loads itself and is able to cut and separate the sheets of metal into strips. The fresh strips are taken to the production line, where they are fed into the body former. One by one, these strips are fed to the former and bent around a mandrel by forming wings. The sides are crimped and given a perfect seal by a large hammer which rises from underneath the mandrel and completes the forming of the can's body. The can is then picked up by a magnetic belt, which takes them to a seaming machine. Monday cans are not made out of purely tin. This is part because of cost. What we now make them out of is steel coated with tin, because the tin provides the antibacterial properties, whereas the steel provides the structural properties. And both processes of coating with tin and producing steel are well known and well understood, and very easy to continue with the manufacturing processes while keeping food cheap. Here, a flange, which is a type of rim, is attached to the top of the can. The base is also fitted and seamed into place, completing the can's production. The cans are gathered onto pallets and taken to be boxed, along with the lids, which will not be fitted until each can has been filled with its various different types of products. The tin can. Truly a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realised their amazing background. High heels, space blanket and cans, all wicked in vain.